Hello, everyone, and welcome to our next hit of World Rugby's Inside the 22 podcast slash vodcast, where we check in with the biggest names in world rugby. And it is our first dip back into the world of Irish rugby with this episode. Coming up, a man who's played across three provinces, represented the national team. We've had O'Driscoll. Now we get JC, John Cooney. How you doing, buddy? Thank you very much. Um, I don't know if I'm anywhere near uh, the Brian O'Driscoll. But um, I'm chuffed to be on this um, and also a big fan of yourself. I used to always watch you at 10 a.m. on a, a Saturday morning with my, my fly. So <laughs> it's good to see you in person. I used to be the highlight of my week watching the Brumbies on a Saturday morning. <laughs> you need uh, you need better pursuits. I'm happy to say that to you off the back. Listen, uh, mate, it's really nice to catch up with you. How's ISO been treating you? How have you been getting through it? I have a look through your Instagram, and I've got to say, your trick shotting of tea bags, outstanding. Thank you. Yeah, um, that's back to my youth when I was young, and um, probably when I was meant to be in doing my my studies. I used to spend a couple of hours out in the garden uh, with a soccer ball. So. Yeah, I saw a few. I think Danny Kerr had one up and maybe the competitive aspect of myself. I thought oh, I might as well take him on and see see if I can do a better one. So I remember my girlfriend coming down on a Sunday morning shouting at me for, for jumping around the kitchen for about an hour trying to get them. <laughs> um, so she wasn't very pleased. But yeah, I spent a couple of hours doing a couple of other trick shots when I'm meant to be running around the field. So <laughs> half the time I'm out meant to be doing my conditioning on, on doing trick shots and and one of them, I think I was kicking myself in the calf so much that I have a bit of a sore calf now because I kept missing. So that, that Instagram one where you've lobbed the tea bag into the cup, that's legit? You're drinking, you're drinking a little green or some chamomile yeah. now? That's, you've landed that? You'll never, the, the second one, I actually basically got my first go, which I couldn't even believe and uh, pretended that it, uh, it was that casual. I remember seeing it and be like, oh, I got it. Um, but the first <laughs> one, I'll be honest, took me about an hour and I was sweating. I had to have about four different goes because you – you get pretty tired doing it. I was sweating so much. I like that none of your teammates believe it actually went in, but you've got it there all lined up. Now, mate, we normally kick these chats off with either across Instagram Live or on the Inside 22 podcast with our guest best off-field story. So I'm going to throw some up because I'm throwing this at you cold. Uh, here's what sort of been before. So he had his CV, was... Happy to tell us a story about the time that Julian, his big brother, belted him on the All Blacks bus and said, back in your box, Junior Burger. Uh, Dane Coles, All Black hooker, missed the team bus after his All Blacks debut. Drew Mitchell, former Wallaby Fort Buster Rhymes in a New York bar at about 4 or 5 a.m. in the morning. What's your best off-field story? And you can kind of push the envelope as far as you want or keep it as close to the chest as you like as well. Oh, that's a good question. Um, this is kind of on field, but it's not a game or anything. But I came back from Thailand um, and we just on uh, Bowden Barrett's Bronco recently, we came straight back to do the Bronco. Um, but this is technically was still our summer holiday. So our fitness coach asked, do we want to come in a day early uh, to do a bit of gym? He never told us we were doing the Bronco after it. And um, so then he, he, he pulled that out of himself out of nowhere and told us we're doing that. So I, my stomach was still a bit sick from Thailand, um, but I, I, I didn't want to pull out. So we started doing the Bronco and, and I was saying to him here, I'm, I'm struggling here, I need to go. Um, and he goes, just go. And I thought he meant just go, okay, keep running. So I was like, are you sure? He's like, keep going, just go. So I was like, okay, I better keep going. And so I got to my third rep of the Bronco and I was like, Kev, no, no, I, I really need to go. And he kept just saying, just go, but he meant the toilet. I was like, okay, I'm going to go. So I ended up having a little bit of an accent down my leg when I was doing the Bronco. <laughs> but I got too embarrassed then that I didn't even finish it. So I only got to the fourth rep and I was like, no, through this. So I ran into the toilet. Um, and yeah, and everyone started laughing at me when I ran into the toilet. And I had to throw them in the bin anyway. Um, and then, yeah, I had a bit of a nickname. Yeah. So I'm the fear of the Bronco now. I'm going to go run it today and I hate it. I you get the shakes. Like scared. <laughs> yeah. You got so, Bronco PTSD. Then, I've never been I'm, about, I'm about 20 seconds slower than Bone Barrett now because I'm running around like that. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> oh, that is outstanding. I'll tell you what, off a short run, you've delivered an absolute cracker there. Uh, uh, JC, another one before we get into the footy side mm-hmm. of things. I've loved the campaign that you've launched. So what's your animated clip that you bounced out uh, on your social pages and I chased it down through some of the media outlets in Ireland as well. Uh, the Tackle Your Feelings campaign, can you expand on that animated clip a little bit more? Tell us about how you found yourself with a counsellor and how that in turn helped you through your injury and how it's got you more well-rounded now as a player. And finally, where this next uh, step will take you in terms of this campaign. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a great campaign. It's something I find with younger players throughout your career and, and maybe you're a little bit more selfish because all you think about is your goals and you want to get to where you want in your career. And I was probably similar to, to most players. And early on in my career, it looked, it looked good for me getting, uh, I think it was 22 caps for Leinster. I, I'd won the European Cup and it looked like the trajectory that I, I'd hoped for was going my way. And then, like sports, pretty fickle. Um, a couple of surgeries on my shoulder and and I went out on loan and it's pretty hard when you're going to a new club and, and you get a couple of injuries early on and, and you don't get that continuity. Um, and yeah, I think everyone day to day in life struggles. And at that time I'd have my third surgery on my shoulder and uh, there's a big impact on your rugby life, on your on your day to day life. And, and I was living away from my family and I was just struggling um, a little bit, no way depressed or anything, but I was just struggling with certain things. And, and my sister told me that um, I should go see somebody and, and like most people I said why would I bother but eventually I just thought why not and even just to break down your personality and better understand yourself and and think I come across quite a confident person and, and within probably the first session she broke that down pretty, pretty quickly and made me understand there's more to that than than what meets the eye and and then that kind of put me down a path of understanding psychology and and kind of using that to better myself rather than always being that hard worker before I taught a, a good rugby player just worked incredibly hard and and kind of through that, I, I learned a lot about myself and then kind of delved into psychology and and kind of understood myself a bit better and understand the impact that can have on my rugby career. And, and kind of since then, I've never looked back and, and kind of improved on myself a lot. So this was all before you'd actually represented Ireland, I think I'm right in saying. And one of the things that jumped out at me from that clip, which is terrific, by the way, was the councillor's suggestion for you to train as if that you were actually already an Irish representative. How did that help refocus you and get you headed in the right direction? Yeah, definitely, because I think you can kind of slip into bad habits and, and kind of let yourself off with, with some bad standards, and I'd probably let that happen. And as I said in, in the video, I was nowhere near where I wanted to be, and, and I remember doing doing a lot of fitness in, in Galway, which the weather is pretty horrific. So it was hailstones and rain and, and kind of the only thing that got me through that in December and um, was the hope that I could make that tour because I knew there was an opportunity in the June of that summer and um, with the Lions tour and Conor Murray going on that and that I, I could sneak in. So that was kind of the only thing that drove me through that. And I knew um, that if I trained by those standards and trained as if I was an international and, and pulling myself up, if I threw, threw a couple of bad passes in training, that that was going to kind of get me where I needed to get to. And, Having Karen Marmin, who was an Irish international at the time, um, in my position, kind of let me know the standards I needed to have. So I, I kind of always put myself at, at the standards he was and, and tried to kind of emulate what he was doing, which in the long run kind of helped me. Stay with the Ireland uh, representative side of things. Talk me through when you reached that milestone and you got that chance to play against Japan on that tour. How... Uh, overcome were you with uh, I guess emotion off the other side of going through that hard graph to actually reach it and how did you celebrate it it kind of seems like I'm bad luck Brian here so we went on that tour <laughs> and, and everybody had been capped by the first two games by myself so there's about 12 of us uncapped and I was the only one going into the third game without a cap I was pulling out my hair thinking here I am on this tour everyone else capped and I'm not going to get a cap and um, but I was put on the bench for the last game um, and then eventually, yeah, I think I, I only got like 10 or 12 minutes against Japan, but it was just nice to take that off. As I said, I, I made that goal, but God, the first two weeks, I was <laughs> I <told> myself <laughs> that I wouldn't get that. Back. I couldn't believe it. I remember after the second game being like, oh, don't put your head down, just kind of train. I th- I'm pretty sure I was training at out half as well, and I don't even play out half. And I was like, how am I going to prove myself that I should get a game here? Um, but I went down and I trained well, and that gave me the opportunity. So. Yeah, we, we then went out in Japan on that night and pretty sure I got carried home after it in, in a dress, I think, as well. So, <laughs> um, I don't remember too much, don't remember too much of the celebrations, but I know I just moved to Ulster as well um, and Sean Reedy carried me home. So 
I felt the love for my new teammates <laughs> quite early on. It sounds like you had a night in Rapongi, which many of us went through at the World Cup. <laughs> yeah. You don't exactly, have to say, yeah. you don't have to say anymore. I, it's okay. We can park it there exactly. and move on to the Ulster. So am I right in saying that you are the only man to ever represent three of the Irish provinces uh, and then run up 20 or more caps with each? That's that's pretty handy. Yeah, I think so. I only saw that recently. I know there's a, there's actually a couple of scrum halves who have played for three provinces, so maybe maybe it's a scrum half thing. But yeah, I think I was the first to get 20 in each province, which is is a little milestone. People keep asking me. It's the first question I always get asked. And when are you going to go to Munster? Um, but I don't think that's going to happen. No. What Can you ex describe the difference between each of those provinces for those in the Southern Hemisphere who might not be particularly savvy around Irish rugby? What is the different fabric, I guess, is the best way of framing the question around each of the three that you've played at? Yeah, it, it, for me, it was a little bit different coming through. So I came through Leinster um, Academy and I was around 20, 21 when I broke into the senior team. But at the time, it was... It was quite an older team, so it was the, the O'Driscolls, the Darcy's, and the Nisewa. So at the time, they were all late into their 30s. And for me, it was Isaac Boss and Owen Redden were the two scrum halves. And I think they were both 30, between 32 and 35 when I was there, and they both played for Ireland. So um, I remember maybe I'd get one game, and then I'd, I'd get out, and they'd come back, and the two of them would kind of interchange for the next six months. It was pretty difficult to, to take your opportunity and there'd be times I'd find myself in a game, I'd make a mistake and think, oh, well, here, I'm not going to play for another six months here. So it was an incredibly competitive atmosphere and there was such strength and depth in the squad that as a young player, it was quite difficult. And I think I was the first one to come through my academy year. So I found it quite hard when, when players that I grew up with um, were still in the academy and, and playing um, with, say, the, the A team. So... I found it quite hard to, to feel involved in that squad and I was obviously lucky enough to win a lot but when I went to Connacht I, I kind of felt more more part of the squad and I was quite lucky to be there when we won the Pro 12 which was um, compared to say the Leicester City football team that year and no one mm. kind of expected us to win it but it was definitely it, probably the, the most enjoyable year I've had on a, on a rugby field even though I had two surgeries that year but it was just an unbelievable atmosphere within the squad and and then up here with the North Star, I find it quite similar to, to Connacht. It's it's kind of more inclusive in that everybody, no matter what, whether you play for the A team, whether you're 30, excuse me, 35 or 21, I, I feel that everyone's part of the squad. You've been on it for 10 years now. What keeps motivating you to keep rolling uh, in Irish rugby? It's a good question. During this time, especially, I yeah. found myself on Monday having zero motivation to do anything uh, I plan on actually taking next week off completely just to, to take a break. Um, what motivates me, it's probably that. Um, I find it weird because for the first, say, eight, nine years of my career, I was always trying to prove people wrong. And, and now I was getting all this praise, praise throughout the year and I kind of have to flip it on its head now and kind of prove people right. So it's it's kind of changing that. And as I say, I'm getting I'm 30 now and people are starting to call me old. So um, a few of the lads were joking, saying I'm a bit like Benjamin Button. I'm aging backwards at the moment. So I, I feel great physically, and I've been hitting markers that I've been chasing, say, for about five years, and I finally hit them, and I'm here eating cheesecake and donuts every day. So I don't know what's going on. But I, feel, I feel great at the moment, anyway. How do you, you reevaluate where you want to be? So obviously you set that target, I'm guessing, way back when to represent Leinster and then you set that target to represent your country, you achieve that. What becomes your goal on the other side of hitting what you've got? Yeah, that's that's another good question. I, I, I think it's, it's easy to get kind of comfortable where you are and I think the more success you get, the, the more hungry you get to, for more and more and I think you keep resetting those goals and for me it was to make the Irish squad and now it's to get starts for Ireland and obviously next summer is a big big one for everyone I think it's the Lions tour and I never would have set seen myself as having an opportunity to do that but again uh, I probably looked a million miles away but five years ago I think it was five, a couple of years ago anyway I sat down and made that a goal for me in three or four years and I was probably not even near an Irish squad at the time but um, I remember writing it down and now I'd be lying to say that's not in the back of my head and give me some sort of drive at the moment to get through this. And it, it's a massive goal, but it's something that if I take that off, it would, probably, it would be by far the biggest thing I've ever done in my career to, to go back to playing AL only a couple of years ago to, to now where I am would be huge. I think just making the touring squad for South Africa would be just 
incredible. Having I did Cape Town last year, the Cape Town Sevens, mate. They are nuts for rugby over there. It is epic. Oh, uh, I was reflecting yesterday. I I was playing for Connacht Day against Germany about four years ago. I look back, I was like, that has to be the lowest point of my career, <laughs> playing against Germany while the whole kind of uh, European team were, were getting ready for a huge game because I was cup tied, I couldn't play for them. I just remember being, I'm out here playing Germany. Uh, I, I just look back at the yes, I mean, like to go from playing Germany, it wasn't even their first team, I think it was like their second team to, to hopefully get near something like that and playing for Ireland, it's, it's been a huge, huge journey to come from that. I've been having another look at, uh, I guess, one of the other things that sort of makes you a double, triple, quadruple threat is the fact that you can knock goals over from anywhere. I've been watching some of your highlights this afternoon just to get into the mood. And I also caught some of your pre-game uh, actions and, I guess, little processes that you go through. Am I right in saying that you're throwing noise-cancelling headphones on and then pumping crowd noise through it? to get you in the mood and into the right headspace for when that's actually going to eventuate on game day? Yeah, we we did that before the Claremont game. It was actually um, our skills coach who came up with it due to the stadium being pretty intense and a pretty hard stadium to play in. So he got a recording of, of the fans and he put it on a, a minute or two clip. And I came in on, I think, on a Wednesday and he, he suggested that and I thought it was a good idea. So uh, we tried that and, and put it on. And I, I kind of enjoyed doing something a little bit different. I like like those ideas of, of things being a little bit different. Um, and it was good, it was good to try something out. And then when we got there, um, it made it that little bit easier when, when the crowd was shouting. So How loud cool. does it get in some of those French cities? How parochial are they? That That's definitely the, the stadium I found hardest playing in. Um, and then we played La Rochelle a couple of years ago as well. And that was, that was pretty intense. And um, I also had a stinker that day. I came on at out half <laughs> and I, <clears throat> I'd been told all summer, we're not going to play out half. I was like, okay, great, right, because I don't play out half, but I can do it if you need it. And then I come in on Monday morning, yeah, we're going to look at you playing out half. I was like, oh my God, I don't know what I'm doing. They brought me on at 50 minutes and I basically lost this the game. I was like, crap. Well, I think and you need to push. <laughs> they scored after that and then I threw about three passes on the deck and they scored a couple more. <laughs> You know, I, you should, you, you should just scra- they can they can give you the out half spot. You should just scramble straight into the base of every ruck or at the tail of every mall possible, and force someone else to step in there instead of yourself. Let them slip up. That was basically what I was doing. I kept running to the rocks and be like, "Oh no, I'm not meant to be there." <laughs> hey, uh, that was this is a great segue into our rapid fire questions that we normally get through to sort of close out each of our chats on uh, our Instagram lives and our Inside the Twenty Two World Rugby podcast catch ups as well. Uh, these, I think, you're going to going on your previous twenty minutes. I think you're going to be okay with these. Following on from your chat around your goal kicking, you've got an up-and-coming goal kicker in Irish rugby. If 12-year-old comes to you and says, JC, how do I take shots at goal? What's your one bit of advice that you can share with me so I can kick like you can? Thing is, I'm actually still relatively new to kicking. I only started doing it about three years ago, maybe three and a half years ago. Um, I was that annoying player who came on the field, put the ball down on the corner and kicked it and, and kind of laughed at the kickers being like, why are you trying so hard? <laughs> um, and then uh, when I got my opportunity, I kept missing the easy ones. So, um, yeah, I'm still quite new to it, but I, I, I'm big on the striking of the ball. And I'd always recommend kids at 12 to play different sports, whether it's uh, football or, or for us soccer. Because um, for me, growing up, that was my main sport. And, and then through kicking now, I find it, a lot easier to strike the ball just due to your planned foot and and kind of the natural ability you have from striking a football so i'd always recommend to a kid at that age to kind of play a couple of sports and and if you can play football as well as rugby i i think that's probably for me the biggest thing that i take into goal kicking is that kind of more natural ability to kick a ball nice one nice one this will be a little trickier for you you win an around the world trip all paid for all expenses you can only take one man with you your options are Bundy Aki or Rory Best, who do you take and why? I don't think I could take Bundy because i never get him home. <laughs> he's, he's, one of the loose, he's, he's more of the loose type. Whereas Bestie, well, Bestie uh, has a wise head and the shoulders when he doesn't have a few drinks on him. Um, that's difficult. I, I think I'd take Bestie um, just because, yeah, for that reason that I don't think i get Bundy home. 
and then I get in trouble. <laughs> Too good. You've got one rugby do-over, good or bad, what would it be? So you can relive a positive moment or you can go back and correct something that may have gone a little skewy for you. I'd relive that Connacht um, final, the Pro 12 final. Um, I actually dislocated my shoulder after two minutes coming on, so I do over that. I never hit a ruck. Since then, I haven't hit one ruck. Um, <laughs> I went in, went in trying to get a jackal turnover, and within a second, my shoulders popped out. And since then, I think I've had one jackal in, in three years, and um, I never go in anymore. I've kind of learned to be a smart scrum half. You don't hit rucks. Um, so I do over that, but then I'd also do over the three days of celebration. Nice one. That should be advice for 12-year-old kids as well. Don't go near rucks. Yeah, don't ever hit rocks. You don't need to. Don't go near rocks. Uh, next one for you. For you. <laughs> next one for you. And we're uh, closing you on the back end of this. You are a very polished uh, talker and presenter. I want you to give us a review of a TV series that is at the top of your list that we all have to watch before lockdown rounds out. God, you're putting me under pressure here. I think everyone's watched The Last Dance, mm. Michael Jordan documentary. And um, so you want to review. And um, he reminds me of kind of The Water Boy. Have you seen The Water Boy? I've seen everything. I've seen The Water Boy. You know, when they, they have to motivate him by making up stuff or getting them to pretend <laughs> that people's heads are in other people's bodies. So that's what MJ reminds me of when he, he seems to make up stuff for people's heads. So he gets, gets motivated for all the playoffs. <laughs> <laughs> I reckon I could ask a million people to give me a review on The Last Dance and none of them would draw the analogy between Bobby Boucher and Michael Jordan. But now that you've given it to me, it makes all the sense in the world. Michael yeah, Jordan yeah, is perfect. Bobby Boucher. The water, water sucks and he's going around <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna go watch it tonight to uh, to get myself through. Not the last dance. I'm gonna go back and watch Bobby Boucher and Waterboy yeah. Adam Sandler to get me through the back end of uh, isolation. One more for you. You got to finish this sentence for me. Uh, my teammates would describe me as dot dot dot. Oh, there's too many words. I'd say. Um, Ian Henderson had a word haughty. H a u g h t y, um, I wouldn't have the exact definition, uh, but I think that was quite a good word. He put it up on the the wall in the Ulster chain rooms because it like describes an Ulster man, um, is the word haughty. I think it's like co confident in himself, but so something else. I can't. People have to go Google it. But is he um, in nineteen thirties like crime writer? What the hell does that mean? Haughty. I know he, he's the smart one in the squad. He's the one that any sums are. Or any questions that people go to him. So there you go. I can leave that. Okay, have to I'll go take and look it. it up. Jake, any is haughty. All right, we'll take that. And we and the other thing is you've got to kind of get the pronunciation of it right. You're you're haughty. You're haughty. Um, thank you, mate, for I'll, I'll uh, joining. Us. You're going to Google it for us, are you? While we're while we're yeah. rounding things out, you go ahead. Arrogantly, ar arrogantly superior and disdainful. Oh no, actually, wait, I don't want that. <laughs> 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 you can give him a clip when you get back to training with each other. Hey, uh, thanks so much for uh, thanks so much for joining us, mate. It's been terrific having you on uh, World Rugby's Inside the Twenty Two. And just tell us again, how can we stay on top of and track the campaign that you're a part of? Where do we go? What are the hashtags? And how can we keep a track of your progress around it? Yeah, um, there's the Tackle Your Feelings uh, page on Instagram. I think it's at TYF and also the hashtag Take Control. Um, I share it on my own page as well. So, yeah, it's a great campaign. And, and I'd urge people even just throughout the day, my girlfriend made a little mindfulness corner um, in our house uh, with a little butter and a little bean bag. And, and I find just 10, 15 minutes to myself on that makes a big difference. Uh, even if I've had a day of playing Call of Duty or or done nothing with my time looking at my phone. It kind of makes me feel a bit better throughout the day. So I have to go run that Bronco. So I might do a little bit of that now so they don't have the fear going into it. So uh, a couple of minutes to yourself. Make it you go hit the beanbag, Jay Cooney. Thank you so much for uh, joining us. And we will keep a keen eye on you when you return to the park. And thank you for joining World Rugby's Inside the 22. No worries. Thank you for having me.